Let's take a look at infrared spectroscopy. So these are the filled in template notes from first semester. I'll provide these to you through our Canvas website. So we're all familiar with the electromagnetic spectrum here. So we know, for example, that we have a higher frequency up here at the top and a lower frequency down here at the bottom. Right, we have our gamma rays ranging all the way down here in lower energy to our radio waves. And just highlighting a couple key points here. For x-rays, we have x-ray crystallography. That's the technique that's used to really get good images of proteins and enzymes, for example. We have ultraviolet spectroscopy. We'll talk about this in more detail later on in our semester. And we have infrared. Infrared is where we're going to identify functional groups. There's microwave radiation, often used to determine bond lengths, and radio waves, which are used in nuclear magnetic resonance, or MRI. Now, a little bit of physics review. Looking at some formula, we have frequency, we have um, wavelength down here below, um, and they're inversely related to each other by the following expression, right? where C is our speed of light. So an increase in frequency is a decrease in our wavelength. Now, energy is related to wavelength and frequency by the following formula. Delta E is equal to H nu, or HC over lambda, where H is Planck's constant. Now the new thing that's introduced in infrared spectroscopy is wave numbers. And wave numbers are listed down here below. They're like a frequency with this little bar over the top. And they're equal to inverse wavelengths. So the units are inverse lengths, right? So for IR, it's usually centimeters to the minus one. Now for IR, that's gonna be on our X axis. Now we can substitute that in to the expressions here down below for our energy. And we can gather from that that a decrease um, in our wavelength right, from our expression here is equal to an increase in our wave number. Now that expression can be related to this top expression, right? Because we have an increase in our frequency. So there's an increase in our frequency is equal to a decrease in our wavelength, decrease in our wavelength, decrease in our wavelength, equal to an increase in our wave number. Now, that then has the net result of indicating that an increase in our frequency is equal to an increase in our wave number. So for me, it's very easy to visualize an increased frequency. Something vibrates faster, right? It's oscillating back and forth at a faster frequency. But a faster wave number is just a harder thing to grasp, I think. Now in IR spectroscopy, we have different types of bond vibrations. Now there's two basic types really. Um, there's stretching and there's bending. So you may have come to think as molecules as having rigid bond lengths and bond angles, right? especially when you work with your, like your Molly mod sets and, and your molecular model sets, right? They're rigid. It's not the actual case though, since bond lengths and angles represent average positions about which atoms vibrate. So those bonds themselves can actually move. Now one way that we visualize those bond vibrations is to treat them as two balls, right? Those are our atoms connected by a spring. So we have here, right? This is your atom. You have another atom here, and here is this spring force that's our stretch spring. So that's your bond strength or your bond length, right? So we can push them in together. They can become compressed and they'll They'll expand back out and they'll essentially, um, I guess, settle into some equilibrium bond length. Now in physics, because we have a spring with connected, um, connecting two balls here, we can use Hooke's law. So in Hooke's law, as we look at this analogy up above, we have these two balls. They can be stretched and compressed any distance, right? So if you have a spring there, you can pull it out a centimeter, 1.1 centimeters, you know, three centimeters, whatever the spring will allow you to do. At some point, it'll break, right? But you can compress it or, or pull it as much as you'd like. 
So we can see that down here below. This is your spring displacement. So any amount is allowed here. So we have this continuous line here of potential energy as we, as we stretch the spring larger and larger. At some point, it breaks though, right? Um, now in, in chemistry though, we know that atoms love to be quantized. So discrete energies are only allowed there. So they're not allowed to vibrate or be stretched at what, whatever energy you, you prefer to stretch them at. They only can be stretched certain frequencies. Now, this has an important consequence. It means that if you have a carbon double bonded to an oxygen, for example, like a carbonyl of an aldehyde or a ketone, the, the stretching frequency of that bond is discrete and it is only allowed certain numbers. That's convenient because if it's only allowed certain stretching frequencies, then it only has a certain discrete wave number. And because of that, it shows up on our IR spectrum at characteristic locations. So you can look at a spectrum and say, aha, that peak right there must be from a carbonyl of an aldehyde, for example. So you can go through and do some mathematics here. And if you go on and take more chemistry, it's more involved than this. But the Hooke's Law, um, can basically be kind of um, narrowed down to the following expression. So your, your, your wave number here, that's on your x-axis, right, is equal to this constant, 1 over 2 pi, times the square root of k. Now that's your force constant. And for us, that's how, how difficult is it to compress your spring. And remember, the spring represents the bond. So that's, a, that's proportional, in, in essence, to your bond strength. And this mu down here below, this little u, this thing is your mass. So it's the mass of the atoms. So the important thing to point out here, and this is critical, we're going to see this down here below, but the important thing to note here is that your wave number is dependent on that bond strength and masses. Right? It's the square root of it, but it's proportional to those two numbers. So let's take a look here at some of those relationships. So remember, masses and force constants. So um, here's our formula. So masses of the atoms. Now as the mass of the atoms increase, the frequency of vibration decreases. So look, mass is down here on the bottom. Right? So if we increase that number, then this decreases because they're inversely related. And a decrease in that means that you have a decrease in your frequency. So if we look at this table down here below, we have a carbon connected to a hydrogen with a, a stretching frequency here, or a wave number, I should say, of, a, of 3,000 when we're looking at that wave number. As we put a heavier atom, deuterium is just a 2H here, that frequency decreases um, down right to 2,100 as far as our wave number is concerned. That's our stretching frequency, our wave number. And if we have a carbon atom, which of course is heavier, it goes down to about 1,200. So looking at this table down below, you go from H to carbon to oxygen to chlorine to bromine to iodine. Those atoms are getting larger in size. They're more massive. And our, and our wave number goes down, and that causes our frequency to decrease also. Now, if we keep our masses the same and change our force constant, there's a direct relationship there. So an increase in our K equals an increase in our wave number, which is an increase in our frequency. So down here below, you have an alkane, an alkene, and an alkyne. So that type of bond is changing from an sp3 to an sp2 to an sp. And your force constant is going uh, approximately from 5 to 10 to 15 times 10 to the 5 dynes per centimeter. And the consequence of having a stronger bond here is a higher wave number, a higher frequency. So it vibrates at a higher frequency.
Now, there are other types of bond vibrations. There's these asymmetrical stretching, symmetrical, scissoring, wagging, bending out of plane, bending in plane, twisting, so on and so forth. And these are degrees of freedom that are discussed more if you go on and take um, you know, quantum chemistry, for example, or take a specialized class where you're looking more at the different type of infrared frequencies that are seen on your spectrum. So for us, we're not gonna really be focusing much on those types of vibrations. The absorption process is actually pretty interesting. So it's a quantized process. Remember that only certain amounts of energy are allowed to be absorbed. So in that absorption process, the frequencies of IR radiation, which match the natural vibrational frequencies of the molecule are absorbed in a process called resonance. Right? So it turns out that when that polar bond vibrates, that there's a slight change in the dipole moment of that bond. And that changing electrical dipole and the bond can couple with incoming electromagnetic radiation. And when those two things couple together, we, we have a resonance. Now that resonance changes the amplitude of the vibrational motion, um, are the modes, we say sometimes, of the bonds that are in the motion and we see an absorption process occur. Now the thing that's important to point out here with all of that is this, is that in order for a molecule to be IR active, the mode in the, that it moves, so the way that it's vibrating has to create a change in dipole. So if we look down here below, these molecules absorb IR radiation because they all possess dipoles. These do not, they are called IR inactive, diatomic molecules, our molecules that have symmetrical type of construction are not gonna have dipoles when they stretch. Now the other thing to point out that's kind of interesting here too is that there's certain modes of molecules that are IR inactive in certain modes of that same molecule that are IR active. So carbon dioxide, if we were all asked to draw carbon dioxide, we would all draw this Lewis structure. And then we would quickly determine that there's no net dipole in this molecule. And so we'd say, well, look, in this mode, that molecule is IR inactive because there's no net change in dipole. But remember that these bonds are not static. They're only static in the kits that we build. So they're stretching. And sometimes, for example, that carbon might lie very close to one oxygen and farther away from another one. That changes the magnitude of our vectors for our dipole. And then they therefore don't add up to become zero, and that would be in IR active mode. Another thing that can occur too is that the oxygen atoms can kind of flap their wings down like a bird taking off, right? It's not a low energy conformation, but it's a mode that can occur. And in that mode, that mode is IR active. Let's take a look at what we're gonna be looking at when we analyze IR spectra. So remember we have wave numbers down here on our X axis, and then we have percent transmittance over here on the Y. So that's usually written as percent T or sometimes just listed on our um, actual spectrum. Now if we draw a line on our spectrum right here, right at about 1500 wave numbers, we can, we can divide this into two sections. So over here on the right side, we call this area the fingerprint region, okay? And just like your fingerprint is unique to you, the fingerprint region of particular compounds are unique to that compound. So they match up peak to peak, intensity, pattern, and everything. It's really kind of cool. And then over here on the left side, this is like the business side of the spectrum for us. This is where we're going to be identifying functional groups. And that's our key area for analysis when we start looking at spectra. Now, when we interpret spectra, we want to do a few things. We want to compare our spectra to a reference IR if possible. And this is often the case when we do things like synthesis. If we're just doing unknown compounds, then we can't compare it to a reference because we don't know what to look up, right? Um, we will also want to notice the presence and the absence of peaks. 
So presence is obvious because you're looking for the peak and you see it there and you say, okay, that must be a carbon double bonded oxygen, right? The absence can tell us something too. So for example, if you know that your formula has carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, but on the spectrum, you don't see a peak indicating an alcohol, right, or an OH, it just simply means that you don't have an alcohol as one of your choices for um, a functional group in your molecule. The other thing that we want to do is we want to identify uh, peak characteristics. So we want to look at where does it show up, right? So is it, is it at a lower frequency or a wave number or a higher wave number? That's what we're going to look at. And then we want to look at the peak intensity. So we have weak, right? we have medium, we have strong. And that's often a function of the dipole and the molecule. We then can take a look at the peak shape. So here we have a couple spectrum. We have acetone. So acetone, that's a carbonyl peak right there. It's a very strong peak, and it's also a very nice spike. It's a sharp peak there. All right, if we look over here at ethanol, right, that OH bond is this peak here at about 3,300, and it's very broad. It's very characteristic of an alcohol to have an appearance like this. And then we could have a very broad peak with increased hydrogen bonding of carboxylic acids that makes that OH peak of alcohol stretch even further out. So we see a very broad peak there. And then the other thing that we want to do is we want to consult correlation tables. Um, so I'll show you that in just a second. And we should be familiar with um, some of the key areas here too. So see sp3h's are about 3000 sp2's are about um, about 3100 a little bit greater and sp's are about 3150 ish or so so um, and remember the reason why that occurs is because the bond is stronger right we have a, a stronger bond as we go from single to double to a triple bond yeah carbon carbons at about 1620 Carbonyls are huge. They center around 1720, and OHs center around 3300, and they have that very broad, uh, or broad, um, stretch. Now, the correlation table is provided down here below. For our class, I'll provide this to you. So you'll see this as part of uh, any quizzes or exams that you have where you need to consult these type of charts.